Hello, everyone. I'm Charlie Sharpless, Assistant Director for Research at the Anlinger Center for Energy and the Environment at Princeton University. I'm pleased to welcome you to our new seminar, summer seminar series, New Light, Rising Stars in Energy and the Environment. Here, we feature weekly talks by early career researchers working with faculty at the Anlinger Center, where our mission is to develop practical solutions for a sustainable energy future. This is inherently a transdisciplinary endeavor. In reflection of that, this series spotlights the next generation of leaders from a diverse array of fields across engineering, energy systems, material science, the social sciences, public policy, and more. We're excited to host these outstanding scholars and bring their work to you through these seminars. Before continuing, I'd like to note that if you have questions at any point in the talk, please type them into the Q&A box. At the end, we'll also have the option for raising hand uh, if you'd like to ask a question live. Um, and we will address as many questions as we can get to in the available time. Today, our speaker is Dr. Lin Feng Zhao. Dr. Zhao holds a bachelor's in electrical engineering from Jidan University, a master's in electrical engineering from Tsinghua University, and a doctoral degree in electrical engineering from Princeton University. He's currently a postdoctoral research associate at Princeton with Dr. Barry Rand, an associate professor of electrical and computer engineering and the Anlinger Center for Energy and the Environment. Research in Dr. Ren's lab is broadly aimed at developing next generation thin film devices, um, semiconductor devices for solar cells and LEDs. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ren, who will introduce today's talk. Thank you, Charlie. Um, so with, I don't, I don't wanna belabor this because Charlie already gave a great introduction to Leon Fung's background. The, you know, what, what, I, what I can say is, you know, in the six years or so that Leon Fung has been working with me. He's been very productive and gotten a lot done. And you're going to hear some of that work in the seminar today, particularly work that he's done really driving the work on halide perovskite light emitting diodes in my lab and trying to see if we can push these things to very high current densities that would be needed for um, applications like white lighting or um, uh, even toward electrically pumped lasers from these materials. He's also started a whole research arm of my group looking at the redox activity and degradation of these, these materials as well. Um, so without further ado, Yan Fang, please take it away and, and I'll be back to um, steward any questions you may have. Thank you, thank you for the introduction. Uh... It's really my pleasure to speak to you today. Um, yeah, in this talk, I will uh, show you some of my uh, research topics that I've done in the past several years. Uh, and uh, also feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions anytime during this talk. So, so research on solar cells and LEDs are closely coupled. And uh, as uh, this equation shows, if we get 100% luminescence efficiency, then we will get the ideal voltage, open circuit voltage from a solar cell. But if we fail to get 100% luminescence efficiency, then we will progressively have uh, less and less voltages from a solar cell. So as you can see, the research on solar cell and LEDs are closely coupled. A grid solar cell would also be a grid light emitter. That's why I will talk about these uh, topics in this talk. So I guess we all understand the, the importance of solar cells and LEDs. So we all appreciate that uh, 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 trying to uh, find some renewable energy and trying to learn how to capture them is uh, something that has a uh, global importance. And of course, on the other hand, trying to, to improve the efficiency and reducing the fabrication cost of these energy demanding uh, light emitting uh, devices is just as important because reducing the energy demand is as is important as uh, increasing the, the energy resources. And of course, new devices will enable uh, new applications and, uh, and also making the existing technologies more affordable for wider deployment, such as the driverless cars used for use by using uh, LiDAR systems. So today I will introduce, the, we introduce you a new a uh, class of a uh, semiconductor called metal halide proskite semiconductor. Uh, this material follows the general uh, proskite crystal structure ABX3 
and uh, it is a direct band gap semiconductor, making it uh, promising for optical devices such as LEDs, solar cells, lasers, and photodetectors. Its band gap can be tuned across the full visible spectrum by changing its compositions, which is great for uh, uh, wavelength tunable light emitters and uh, for tandem solar cells. More importantly, this material can be fabricated from solution at room temperature. So it is compatible with virtually any subjects, including silicon, which is great uh, when considering the, that the, uh, we can, there's a, whole, a huge potential to achieve CMOS compatible light emitters based on proscat semiconductor. So, uh, in recent years, we have seen rapid progress on the performance of proscat solar cells and LEDs. On the left figure is the is the uh, efficiency for proscat solar cells, which is already exceeding twenty five percent. This is uh, comparable to commercially available silicon cells, and is is one of the most efficient among all emerging uh, solar cell technology. On the right side, uh, there's an efficiency chart on, on the performance of proscat LEDs. As you can see, the efficiency of proscat solar cells are already uh, similar to the performance of organic LEDs and quantum dot LEDs. Despite this uh, rapid improvements in efficiency, device stability is right now is the bottleneck preventing them from commercially application, real practical uh, applications. So to further improve the performance and the lifetime of these devices, a deep understanding on this material from device physics to chemistry is a must. So in this talk, I will first show you our understandings on the chemical properties of PROSCAT. These understandings will be important for the future development of uh, stable electronic devices based on PROSCAT. And uh, in the second part, I will show you our uh, more device relevant research uh, that have been conducted in our group. Uh, uh, and uh, you will also, I will also show you that uh, uh, taking a multidisciplinary approach will, will be very beneficial for the further development of uh, PROSCAT devices. Actually, there's rich chemistry in PROSCAT. I will start with an extreme case here. So this photo is a degraded PROSCAT solar cell. One natural question would be, where is the contact? So you know, for any electronic devices, we will need an electrode, but where is it? Actually, this is the photo of the device before degradation. It is a big aluminum context at the center, which has been transparent after device degradation. Of course, this is an extreme case, but shows the, the importance of, chemi of, of a deep understanding of the chemistry in the device. The reactions between PROSCAT and the electrodes has made the, the full device stack fully transparent after device degradation. And, uh, I will show you more details about these reactions. It is well known that uh, both phosphate solar cells and LEDs are sensitive to moisture. But at that time, it is not clear uh, what is the mechanism. People have proposed uh, that it is the water molecules that decompose the phosphate thin film that induced this device degradation. But what I found is that the degradation is induced by the chemical reactions between the electrode and the proscat. We did an in-situ XRD measurement, which gives us more details about the chemical reactions. This bright peak actually uh, corresponding to the metallic lead. So this uh, data gives us the more like details. It is the redox reactions between the the lead ions in proscat and the aluminum electrodes that induced the, the reaction. We further conducted the uh, in situ uh, SEM measurement using an uh, environmental chamber and uh, with well-controlled humidity. We found that uh, for a device stack, 
the morphology changed a lot because of the uh, moisture. These reactions happened well before the decomposition of frostcasting films. As you can see, for area with just the frostcasting films, the morphology does not change uh, significantly. But for a full LED device, uh, you can see a significant degradation is observed. So this, uh, this really shows the importance of, uh, about uh, considering the device stability uh, as, as considering the device as a whole unity for stability uh, test rather than just uh, relying on the, the same film, uh, just the same films of cross so we further uh, tested the, the redox chemistry on different cross-cut compositions and on different uh, electrodes. What we found is that the redox chemistry also happens for cross-cut compositions that do not contain protonic cations, such as the case for system like bromide and system like iodide. This, this observation proves that it is not an acid-induced reaction but rather redox reactions that induce the degradation. And uh, furthermore, we found that these reactions also happen for more or less stable electrodes such as silver and gold. This finding is important because in many device structures, it is very common to have direct uh, metal proscat interface, such as uh, proscat uh, memory devices and um, proscat transistors. And also for the fabrication of prostate solo modules and uh, uh, solo panels, it is also very possible to have direct uh, metal prostate interface. So it is uh, really important to understand this to, to, to understand these reactions. So the take-home message for this part is that prostate are highly redox active, and it can it can react with many different metals. And also why it, the sample becomes transparent is that the aggregated metallic lead uh, aggregated so that it cannot, it only scatter the light but only block the light. So that's why the full device stack becomes fully transparent. So, so I just showed you how the metal ions will contribute to the chemistry, uh, chemical properties of proscat. In the next part, I will show you how the highlight ions will contribute to the instability. People have uh, uh, proposed that the green boundaries may play a role on the instability of cross-scatter devices, which is true. And here I will focus on the study of cross-scatter uh, single crystals to avoid the influence from green boundaries and prove the more, more intrinsic chemical property. Of course, the bucky uh, single crystal with several millimeters uh, thick, it may not be sensitive to the surface chemistry. What we do is that we use the so-called uh, 2D proscite, which is basically using organic cations to slice down the 3D proscite crystal structure and make the layered crystal structure. And uh, the van der Waals forces between these organic molecules will allow us to exfoliate into the thin films. So basically we make a thin crystals very thin to make to, to be more sensitive to the surface chemistry. And furthermore, we fabricated the electronic devices to probe very sensitively the chemistry and the surf on the surface. We build a 2D proscat graphene heterostructure device. And uh, here I'd like to show some background on the graphene transistor. Because of, the, because of the low carrier density at the direct point of graphene, we will apply a gate voltage to adjust the, so that the film level is aligned with the direct point of graphene. We will see a current minimum. With this background knowledge, we tested our device and found that there are two current minimum. This is because the, we only covered the uh, half of the graphene channel with proscat, and the interaction between proscat and graphene shifted the Fermi level, Fermi level of graphene uh, for this part. So one current minimum, minimum 
corresponding to the graphing channel that are not covered by, by proscite. And the other current minimum corresponding to a graphing channel that are covered by proscite. More importantly, we observed the, the, some instability on the light illumination, illumination. What we found is that after light illumination for half an hour, one current minimum stays stable, but the other current min minimum shifted towards the more negative gate voltage. Correspondingly, this means the, the graphene covered by proscat becomes more in type. Since the, on the thermal equilibrium, the Fermi lower is aligned, this results indicates the proscat becomes more in type after light illumination. So we further uh, studied the mechanism that induced the in type doping of proscat. And we found that it is related to added loss in proscat. As you can see here on the surface of the proscat, the concentration of added is, is lower than the in the bulk. We further confirmed the, the, the added loss related to in type doping based on a polycrystalline thin film. And indeed, we, by the, from the UPS measurement, we confirmed the in type doping effects by uh, induced, induced by the light illumination. So this means that the proscat are not stable on the light, which is really uh, uh, an issue, an instability issue. What we found is that we can overcome this issue by, by using a added blocker layer. In this case, we apply the graphene top layer uh, on, on the proscat thin film. In this case, we found there's no added loss, which means that we provide an important strategy to, to improve the stability of proscatacin films. So for this part, the take home message is that the added iodine chemistry plays a significant role on device stability, and we should pay attention to block iodine diffusion and iodine loss. So in the next part, I will show you more device relevant research. Here, I will focus on the device, device of uh, uh, development of LEDs, but I, as I will show you, many of these knowledge can be applied to, to other types of devices, such as LEDs and uh, such as lasers and uh, solar cells. So it is well known that for efficient uh, proscatter solar cell, we need a relatively thick proscatter thin film for better light absorption, and we want to keep the green size big, so for better charge transport. But for LEDs, the principles are a bit different. Right now, there's no like uh, efficient uh, doping strategy for proscat yet. Uh, so in other words, there's no pin junctions for LEDs, unlike the case for inorganic semiconductor based LED. In this case, we have to keep the proscat film very thin for better carrier confinement. But using the established uh, method for developed for proscat solar cells, it is impossible to keep the device thin, as uh, when the films with large green size decrease it become thinner, there will be a lot of uh, pinholes. So to overcome this issue, we developed develop the strategy and making the film very small, very with very small green size. The trick is that we added a bulky organoammonium halide additive into the, into the precursor. And uh, during the film formation process, these additives can prevent the crystal growth of these proscatter nanocrystals. In this way, we were able to confine the, the green size around 10 nanometer. And uh, because of the small green size, we were able to tune the proscatter film from several tens of nanometer up to several hundred nanometer thickness. We also found that these additives can have some defect passivation effects. I will show you, um, discuss more details about the defect passivation. But here, using this strategy, we were able to, uh, to improve the efficiency of uh, both red and green proscat LEDs significantly. For planar device structure, most of the light are trapped 
because of the total reflection, internal reflection in the device structure. So here we, by optic, optical simulation, we found that uh, the best, uh, the optimized uh, film thickness is around uh, 35 to 40 nanometer. These simulations are confirmed ex experimentally with different uh, power scatter comparisons. For all these, for all these power scatter comparisons, uh, we get the highest uh, EQE uh, with thin films around 40 nanometer. Actually, the 17% EQE for, for this uh, device uh, proscat comparison, I think is one of the best uh, efficiencies reported for devices with that, without any light art coupling strategies. So the take home message for this part is that the design principles for cross-scale solar cells from the engineering as well perspective are different compared to cross-scale solar cells. And we need to increase the carrier density for better light emission. Since we have shown the importance of these additives, we would like to know more about the, the, the role of the molecule additive. So here we, we want to answer basically two questions of how these additives can passivate defects and how these additives will influence the mechanical property of the frost thin film. So here we selected five different uh, molecule additives with different uh, structures to understand this uh, optical and uh, uh, mechanical property. So here we measure the fraction energy of the cross-cutting film as an indicator about how resistive the film is to cracking. And we measure the photoluminescent quantum yield as an indicator about how efficient the light emission is. When we compare the BAI, DDI, or PMAI versus the PAI, when, where we tune the, the actual chain's length, you can see the fraction energy increased if we increase the, uh, the additive size. But on the other hand, the photoluminescence uh, quantum yield decreased. So in other words, if we control the, the, the alcohol chain length on the additives, we will have a trade-off between optical and the mechanical property. On the other hand, if we introduce the fluorine, then if we compare the PMEI and FPMEI, both the fraction energy and the photoluminescent quantum yield increased. So in other words, we overcome the trade-off between optical and the mechanical property by introducing the fluorine. The fluorine. We further try to understand the mechanism. Uh, what we found is that in, because of the strong electron withdrawing a capability of fluorine, uh, the fluorine into the uh, additive has higher uh, dipole moment and they form the hydrogen bond with between these molecules. This greatly increased the binding energy and the interactions between these molecules so that the, it in, increased the mechanical stability as well as the defect passivation effects. Based on that, we demonstrated the uh, flexible cross-scale LEDs based on uh, silver nanowire electrodes. Consistent with our previous uh, like, uh, observation, the, the, edit, the foreign native additives give the highest uh, light emitting efficiency and the best uh, mechanical stability after conducting the, the, the binding test. So the take home message for this part is, is that the molecular chemistry is important for the development of uh, cross scatter devices. Then I will show you our efforts towards the band gap tunability uh, and the applications on LEDs, lasers, and solar cells. It is well known that the band gap of cross scatter can be tuned uh, by changing its composition. For example, here, by changing the ida to bromide ratio, we can change the band gap uh, like uh, from green to red. However, if we simply mix things together, there's a red gap. We cannot tune the emission wavelengths precisely. P 
people have reported that adding sesame into the film can help. And indeed, we observed the well tuned uh, uh, emission wavelengths at the beginning, but it's not very stable. And after some electrical and optical stress, the, the, the red gap issue reappears. Using our strategy by adding uh, the bucket organo ammonium additives, we were able to precisely tune the wavelengths and it's very stable. We further studied the mechanism at the nanoscale. We found that for the control samples, for air, the distribution of white and bromide are not uniform. For areas where the bromide concentration is high, the added concentration is low. And for areas where the bromide concentration is low, the added concentration is high. This highland migration caused the red gap issue. And using our strategy, uh, these uh, organic additives can prevent the highlight migration. And you can see the distribution of bromine and iodide are very uniform. So using this strategy, we were able to demonstrate the wavelengths tunable cross scat LEDs. As you can see here, the, 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 the light emission energy are linearly tuned with the absorption edge. But for the control samples, the the emission can only be like a like a like a green or red, you know, corresponding to the the added rich and the bromide rich uh, emission light emission. This strategy can also be used for uh, proscate solar cells. As you can see, the open circuit voltage for the control samples is uh, cannot be tuned uh, correspondingly. Uh, with the absorption edge. But using our method, the open circuit voltage can be linearly tuned, tuned with the band gap. This can really achieve the, the uh, uh, get the benefit from the high open circuit weight voltage from using a wide band gap for scattered semiconductor. And here we compared our data with reported results and uh, we, we filled the, the voltage gap for the mixed uh, highlight proscat semiconductors. In fact, our strategy can make the band gap tunability so stable that even under extreme excitation conditions, we were able to achieve stable wavelength tunable laser uh, based on mixed highlight proscat. So re this really shows how stable the our strategy is as uh, the excitation condition is far from thermal equilibrium for, for lasers. So for this part, the take home message is that the band gap stability, uh, band gap tunability is, uh, is achieved using our strategy and uh, reducing the migration, highlight migration is the key. So in the uh, final part, I will, I will uh, talk about our efforts towards your application in high, high power. As you may already know, like uh, many, thin, many thin film LEDs cannot be used for in high power applications, such as lighting or micro LEDs, such as like organic LEDs or quantum dot LEDs. Similarly, for proscite LEDs, we can see a significant uh, efficiency drop at high current density. Uh, for example, here at 100 milliampere per square centimeter, the EQE drops to only 1%. So a natural question is, is this an intrinsic problem? Can proscale LEDs be used for high power applications? So here we try to understand the mechanism. And what I found is that due to the ionic nature of proscate, uh, the proscat devices are very sensitive to temperature. Here, uh, I showed you like if we increase the environmental temperature from 10 degrees C to 40 degrees C, the lifetime changed a lot. And we monitor the, the device uh, temperature during operation using a thermal camera. And we found that uh, the, on the surface of the glass subjects, the, it did uh, heat it up due to dual heating during the device uh, operation. So we think uh, the proscat LEDs may be uh, possible to operate at high power 
and the, the dual heating prevents the, the, this application. With this in mind, we <coughs> designed several thermal management strategies that can keep, help keep the device cool. First of all, we apply the graphite and the copper heat sink on top of the device. Graphite has very high thermal conductivity, which is uh, very suitable to, to use as a heat spreader. And uh, furthermore, uh, as organic materials it have, it generally have very low uh, carrier mobility, which, is, uh, makes it, which means it is very resistive. Here we use the molecular doping strategies to increase the conductivity of uh, the charge transport layers, uh, for example, POPY2 and PolyTPD, so that we can reduce the voltage required during device operation and uh, reduce the overall power input, input power. Furthermore, we define a smaller device area and fabricate the device on more thermally conductive software. All these strategies can help keep the device cool. For organic doping, it is different compared to inorganic doping like silicon. It relies on total uh, charge transfer between different uh, organic molecules. I won't have time to talk in details, but here we we use we apply the both p-type doping and n-type doping to significantly increase the conductivity of this molecule uh, and the same films. In this way, for giving for giving voltage. We significantly increased the current density for the device. And uh, after applying all the thermal management strategies, we were able to operate the device up to 25 ampere per square centimeter. Uh, this is actually already similar to power LEDs fabricated on based on inorganic semiconductors. And of course, the device lifetime is still a bottleneck. And uh, in the future, we will further improve the device lifetime for high power application. We further uh, uh, studied the device during pulsed operation mode. Yeah, in the pulsed operation, uh, the devices will have more time to, to cool so that it can be operated to a higher, even higher current density. But even during the pulsed operation mode, thermal management is still important. For example here, the black curve shows the control sample without any thermal measurement. And you can see even for a small uh, uh, time period, like uh, 800 nanoseconds, the EL decreased a lot because of the dual heating. But here, after applying the sapphire and the graphite uh, layers, we, the, the EL uh, light intensity is very stable. This really shows the importance of uh, thermal measurement. Based on this uh, uh, past operation mode, we were, able to, we, we were able to operate the device up to 2.5 kiloampere per square centimeter with, uh, with much improved uh, light emitting frequency. Actually, this current range is already approaching to the, towards the electrical driven laser diode. So this is uh, one of the important uh, future application of cross guide. As you know, there's no like a CMOS compatible net emitters yet. So this really shows the, the potential cross guide net emitters for wider application. So for this part, the take home message is that high power operation of cross guide devices is possible and uh, the thermal measurement is, the, is really important for this uh, application. So to summarize, uh, I have first showed you our understanding about the chemical properties of cross uh materials. This understanding is important for the development of stable cross cadre devices. And then I showed you our uh, efforts to further improve the device performance of cross cadre material devices, uh, especially on the uh, solar cells, LEDs, and the lasers. And uh, finally, I would like to thank my uh, advisor, Professor Barry Rand, the lab members, and the uh, collaborators at uh, both Princeton and other institutions. And also, I would like to thank the, thank the funding agencies that have supported my work in the past uh, several years. With that, I thank you for your attention.
Thanks, Leah. Um, are there any questions from the audience? I see Charlie has his hand up. Go for it. Well, then, thank, uh, thanks for that talk. Uh, I had uh, two questions. One is just a um, clarification for me about how some of the measurements are done. And that is um, when you report external quantum efficiencies, is that on a power conversion basis or is that a photonic, you know, electron to photon conversion measurement? And then the more, uh, the, the broader question was, uh, you showed a lot of convincing ways to control halide migration and, um, and some of the other electronic properties. But it seemed to me like the, the metal perovskite interface redox uh, chemistry was, um, and you didn't show it something that looked like an immediate solution to that. And I was wondering if, if that can be controlled by some of the, uh, some of the molecular additives that, that you're putting in there or if that's just an outstanding problem still. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, to answer your first question, the EQE measurement uh, we did is, is using a photo detector to monitor the light output and then convert it to the to the input of, of, and, the, and convert it to the photon number of photons. And then the EQE basically is the number of photons versus the, the number of uh, charge carriers. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, and uh, to answer your second question, the, the reaction between Prosca and the metal, uh, I think of some uh, some like uh, uh, for for functional devices, we have usually have other layers between Prosca and the metal, and uh, we found that uh, the diffusion capability are different. Like uh, you can prevent the diffusion of uh, Prosca and uh, uh, and metals with different uh, materials. That might be a, a solution for the long-term stability of uh, cross-cut devices. And, uh, and of course, for, for the direct interface between metal and the uh, cross-cut, that will be problematic. And we propose that like, trying to find uh, like other conductive materials to replace the metal or work at the, at the interface, such as the uh, carbon-based uh, materials might be a, a, a good solution for this uh, challenge. Right, yeah, I was thinking graphite potentially in, in between, but um, yeah. Cool. Yeah, thank But you. it's still, yeah. still an outstanding problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay, thank you. Thanks, are there, are there any other questions from the audience? I have, I have one, which is about the, um, your slide 43, just a few slides back, you showed these, time yeah the graph here on the left and you have the substrates that lead to more device heating like let's like let's take glass compared to the to the red one so black compared to red curve the it's astonishing to me that you have a totally linear reduction like from zero to 800 nanoseconds it's completely linear do you have a, a reason behind that um yeah because we we didn't monitor the the heat the temperature like uh in the nano with nanosecond resolution uh we are not sure like uh if the the eqe reduction decrease is uh, like uh linearly like uh corresponding to the temperature or, or other issues yeah that why maybe her future work <laughs> yeah it makes sense you know i, I I've looked at those data a lot, but I never really gave much thought to it. So I figured I'd ask. Um, I, yeah, because I really don't know how the temperature correlates to the non-radiative processes in this LED, nor do I know if temperature will change linearly with time. I re I'm really not sure, to be honest. Um, okay, thank you. If there are no other questions, I think we can adjourn. Thank you. Thanks everyone. All right, uh, Lam Peng, thank you again for that presentation. Um, I also want to thank the Anlinger Center staff who are working hard behind the scenes to support the creation and delivery of this seminar series. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank all of you for attending. Uh, next week's webinar will be at 11 a.m. on Wednesday instead of Thursday on June 30th, uh, when Dr. Erin Mayfield will discuss her research on incorporating societal and environmental objectives in net zero energy systems modeling. 
You can find a link to the speaker set, uh, series webpage and registration links posted in the chat box, um, or you will in a moment. And we look forward to seeing you in future talks. In the meantime, stay safe and healthy and have a good week. Yep, and there's the link to the speaker series webpage. Take care, everyone. Thank you.